and address things related to testing. Uh, the latest numbers that came out today uh, at noon show an increase of 1,857 cases across Louisiana. We're just shy of 15,000 uh, cases now at 14,867. And very sadly, there are an additional 35 reported deaths. Uh, that's a total of 512. And if we can go ahead and put up the first, um, those numbers are reflected uh, there. I do want to say again that while we report every 24 hours, it doesn't mean that the number of people that, that I just reported as having died, died in the last 24 hours. Um, there is some lag in reporting and sometimes people die and a test is pending and it's not until the test comes in positive that that death is then uh, reported to us as a, as a COVID death, death. And sometimes I think people are tested completely after, after they have died. And so um, we, we are uh, going to try to uh, start um, uh, reporting, uh, at least internally, the number of people who actually expire over the previous uh, 24 hours so that we can take a look at that. And the reason that's important is, as I mentioned uh, last week several times, the, the real numbers uh, that we're paying most attention to about COVID in Louisiana aren't so much the testing numbers, but the number of hospital admissions and deaths. Uh, because we know there are a lot of asymptomatic people out there. We don't know exactly what that percentage is that have uh, COVID, but they're not going to be tested. Uh, but, but we know from data gathered here in the United States and in other countries, uh, the percentage of people who should be so sick that they have to present to a hospital and the percentage of, of, of the total uh, number of, of COVID uh, positive individuals who will die. And so if you have those numbers, then you have a better idea of, of what you're doing. Um, we have completed it, and I want to thank Dr. Alex B.U. and all the people across Louisiana hospitals, clinics, um, but certainly the Department of Health. We've completed now just shy of 70,000 tests, number two in the nation per capita. Uh, and while we wish we have, could have actually done more tests, and certainly we wish we could have done more earlier, um, the fact that we've been able to ramp up to that number of testing, I can tell you we have a visibility across the state of Louisiana um, that is pretty much unmatched across the, the United States. And as a result, as we get an idea of just how much COVID we actually have, uh, the percentage of people being hospitalized and the percentage of people who are dying are getting much, much, much closer uh, to the average, what you would typically see uh, from, from other states and, and from around the world. Currently, there are 1,809 people who are hospitalized. 563 of them are on ventilators. And while all of the numbers that I just mentioned to you are still high, and they're higher than we would like, we are starting to see uh, real signs that these mitigation measures that we put into place weeks ago are starting uh, to bear real results. And we're hopeful that we're seeing the beginning of the flattening of the curve and that these efforts are going to continue uh, through additional compliance from people across this, the state. Now, we only have a few data points, and, and they don't quite constitute a trend yet, um, but we, we believe that we might be starting to see the, the beginning of flattening the curve. And, I, and, and that's what we believe, and so that's what I'm telling people. The fear is that I'm telling people that, and they're going to say, oh, oh, the task at hand is accomplished. We can go back uh, to doing whatever it is that we normally do and behaving as we normally would. That is exactly the wrong answer. And I say that because if we started the flattening the curve, it's only because of the mitigation measures. It's only because of the social distancing and the improved hygiene practices. And one thing that the president and the vice president, in fact, the vice president called me yesterday and then we had another telephone conference today. One of the things he's pointing out is this need to, to stick with um, the mitigation measures, the stay at home order here, uh, the social distancing, all the good hygiene all the way through the month of April. Um, and, and he asked me to really stress that to people, and of course that is consistent entirely uh, with what I would want to be telling you anyway. Uh, new hospital admissions are down. Now, that hospital admissions as a whole are up, but new admissions are, are trending downward. Um, and as I mentioned to you before, 
the two numbers that you want to really pay the, the most attention to are the number of people going into the hospital each day uh, with COVID and the number of people, people who are dying each day with, with COVID. Uh, of the people who are in the hospital, uh, there's, we, we have an additional 753 vents that we've been able to, I'm sorry, ventilators that we've been able to acquire over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so, so we, we know that, that we're pushing out in time the day uh, that we might potentially overwhelm our capacity to deliver health care, and that is a good thing. Um, but a lot of this has to do with the great work being done in the hospitals themselves because Louisiana doctors, these nurses, these respiratory therapists, um, they are doing some of the best work in the country right now, and I have no doubt that what I'm telling you is, is factual. Uh, I've been telling you that they are heroes because of the work that they're doing and putting themselves um, in, in, in risk of risking their own uh, health in, in order to take care of others. But we now know that they are reducing the number of people uh, who have to ever get on a ventilator in the first place. And they're doing a good job of decreasing the number of days that the average patient has to stay on a ventilator and the number of days that they're actually staying in the hospital. All of these things uh, get factored into our modeling as to when we might run out of beds and, and, and ventilators and so forth. And so it's the, it's the mitigation measures, it's the work being done in our hospitals, and it's the increasing of the hospital beds and the ventilators uh, through the med surge. All of this is, is taking place at the same time, uh, and it's very, very helpful. Of the 753 ventilators that we have received in Louisiana, we have distributed 553 of them. Uh, 200 of them came in yesterday, and they are, they are uh, at the warehouse here in Baton Rouge. Uh, we will distribute those uh, as uh, needed uh, soon. Um, we also uh, got a message that uh, Arkansas is sending five, and I just got off the phone with Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas to thank him on behalf of all the people of Louisiana for their uh, generous uh, contribution to to our state. So we bought ourselves more time that allows us to continue to be able to surge our medical capacity uh, and continue to flatten the curve. And all of this stuff works in concert. And so we need, we have to keep doing everything that we've been doing to have the best possible outcome. The data points that we've been seeing are only going to become a trend if we continue. So the mitigation measures, the stay-at-home order. Uh, the, the hygiene, social distancing, all very, very uh, important. So now we have to keep it up. It's not the time to come, become lax and to ease up. Uh, and the Surgeon General has, has warned not Louisiana so much, but the entire country, that this is going to be a really critical week. It's going to be a difficult week uh, when we see uh, cases and deaths and so forth. Um, so, so we have to stay focused on this. Um, as for the question of whether we have actually peaked, it's obviously too soon to know for sure. Uh, even Dr. Deborah Burks this morning on the White House call noted uh, that weekend data is sometimes not as clear uh, as what you get during the week. And so all around the country, the number of cases that were reported yesterday and the number of deaths that were reported yesterday are, are abnormally low. And that was borne out by the fact that we reported uh, more today uh, than yesterday as well. So we don't quite yet have enough data, but, but it looks like uh, things might be moving in, in a positive direction. Uh, so we should be looking at this data very carefully for the next several days to come. Um, and if we go ahead and put uh, the second graph up there, I want to show you all why it's important that we practice uh, social distancing and good hygiene and why it is uh, that we have the mitigation measures in place to stay at home order and we've closed businesses and so forth all, all of which are very difficult things to do uh, and we know we're asking people to sacrifice uh, but this is data that comes from Johns Hopkins and the calculations are done by Dr. Gary Wagner of University of Louisiana Lafayette and, and what it shows is that half of the top 20 counties, and of course, we're the only state that doesn't go by counties, uh, so it's, it's parishes here, but half of the top 20 counties slash parishes in the country, um, in the nation, with respect to COVID deaths per 100,000 residents, uh, half of those are our parishes. 
St. John the Baptist, Orleans Parish, St. James, West Baton Rouge, Jefferson Parish, Plaquemines, St. Charles, Allen, St. Bernard, Iberville. Um, two days ago, six parishes were on this list. So obviously we have a significant problem here in Louisiana. We've known this for some time now, um, and this bears it out, and it also reinforces the need to continue to do the things that we are doing, except, except to do them actually better, to have more compliance and not less. Uh, with respect to the information that we are sharing with you all, um, we're going to start showing more COVID-19 deaths on our dashboard at Louisiana Department of Health. Um, starting today, we're going to share aggregated data on race, the date of death over time, the, and underlying conditions. As All this will be on the dashboard. That will be updated not every day, but once each week. And you can see this at ldh.la.gov. And this is continued um, proof of our efforts to be as transparent as we can be about what the situation here is in Louisiana on the ground. Uh, and we want to also be as timely as we can be with, with the information that we provide to you all. Um, disturbingly, this information is going to show you that slightly more than 70% of all the deaths in Louisiana are of African Americans. Almost, I'm, I'm sorry, slightly more than 70%. Uh, and so that deserves more attention, and we, we're going to have to dig into that and see uh, what we can do uh, to slow that trend down. Hypertension is the leading underlying condition now for people who have died in Louisiana. Uh, and, and so for all these reasons, we have to continue um, to, to work this as hard as we can, be patient, be focused, be resolute. Um, we're not far behind New York and New Jersey in terms of per capita cases. Um, we make projections to help us plan and allocate resources because we have to be prepared. And we have to be prepared for the worst case scenario that is feasible. But we only get the worst case if people don't do what they're being asked to do. And that is to, to make sure that they're staying at home. Don't go out unless it's absolutely necessary. Minimize your social contact, practice good hygiene and social distancing. If you'd put up graph number three, please. So New York is not on this. This is a, this is a um, chart that was shown to us today by the vice president. And so the, the top line there is New Jersey. The green line underneath that is Louisiana. Uh, and, and so you can kind of see where we are uh, as a state relative to all the others. And the reason New York isn't up there is because it is so much higher, both in terms of the number of cases and its, its uh, per capita uh, case count, uh, that, that they left it off this particular one. But we're number three in the country. Uh, and, and what we need to see is you can see that this crook, we need to see that actually turn flat and then over time uh, come down. And that's exactly what we're looking uh, to do. And the call I had with the vice president uh, yesterday, uh, I was able to thank him for the 20 ventilate, I'm sorry, the 200 ventilators that were sent from the national stockpile. Uh, that decision was made Friday night and they actually arrived in our warehouse over the weekend. I also thank the president uh, for the federal testing sites that we had in New Orleans and Jefferson. Uh, two in, in New Orleans originally, one in Jefferson. The two in New Orleans were since combined uh, because they played a big part in, in our ability to really ramp up our testing and to, to know more about uh, the disease in Louisiana and how it was spreading. And uh, those, those sites were scheduled to be closed on April the 10th uh, by this Friday. Uh, he told me that if we wanted to keep them open, all I needed to do was was make that request, and so I really appreciate that, and we do intend uh, to keep those open. Another important update is that the New Orleans Convention Center uh, Medical Monitoring Station uh, opened today. Uh, there are currently 23 COVID patients there, so basically it's it's one of those wings, if you, if you were there or if you saw it on TV. Uh, what we wanted to do is we want to make sure that we opened it um, a soft opening, if you will, so that we could test the systems, make sure everything is working appropriately before we, we take uh, a lot more patients. And so we have 23 patients there 
uh, presently. This is a step down facility. So it's not where anyone can go as a uh, hospital of, of, you know, to present uh, with, with symptoms. You'll get, if you need, if you're gonna go there, you're gonna be transferred there from another hospital. Uh, and so nobody should be walking up to that hospital to get care and nobody should be presenting that hospital to visit with a patient either because you're not gonna be allowed uh, to visit. And the, the purpose of it is to allow our tier one hospitals to more frequently uh, rotate their beds uh, and to get people out of the hospital sooner than they otherwise would. And this is another uh, measure that we're taking to try to surge our medical capacity. Uh, a note about face coverings, because I know that this over the last uh, few days has become um, an area of interest to a lot of people. As you should know by now, the CDC recommends that people wear uh, a non-medical mask when they leave home uh, to protect each other from COVID-19. And what you're really doing for the most part is you're protecting others from yourself, should you have it. But if the others are actually uh, wearing a mask, then they're protecting you. Um, and typically you don't need to do this if you're out exercising and you're gonna be a long distance uh, from other individuals. But when you're making those essential trips to the grocery store or to the pharmacy or to the bank or to get gas, and you're just gonna have to be closer to other people than is recommended, then that is the scenario under which uh, you would want to have uh, a mask on. And it is still uh, not recommended that you use an N95 mask, which remain in short supply for our doctors and nurses. We need to make sure that they get uh, the, the medical masks, whether they're N95s or surgical masks, and individuals can use cloth, cloth uh, uh, coverings that, that are relatively easy to, uh, to manufacture at home. Uh, and I want to thank the Attorney General. He brought me a pretty one today uh, <laughs> that's uh, got the Louisiana uh, uh, seal on it. So I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Uh, uh, now, obviously, I'm not currently wearing a mask because I'm here uh, talking to you all. But if and when I need to go out in public, uh, let's say I'm going to go and, and uh, look at a facility that we're going to be standing up uh, as a medical monitoring unit or something like that, uh, you will see me uh, in a mask. And I think Alex has decided similarly uh, to wear masks in that, in that situation. Now, please don't think that the mask means that you don't have to follow the social distancing guidelines or the hygiene because you do. This is just one additional measure uh, that you should be taking. Uh, over the weekend, we began sending mass texts with all of these updates. If you didn't receive the updates and you want to, uh, you can sign up by, te by texting LA COVID to 67283. LA COVID to 67283. Um, obviously, uh, this part of the year is going to look different than it has in the past. Um, we're in Holy Week. We're going to uh, have Easter Sunday, and and I think this is when typically there's there's the most demand for crawfish, and you're having the crawfish balls and block parties and and all those sorts of things. Uh, and I understand that this is this is not just different; it's upsetting to a lot of people. Uh, I appreciate that. This is uh, different uh, for me and, and my family as well. I'm just encouraging people to be patient, look at the big picture, and let's make sure that we do what we have to do now uh, so that we can all get together uh, safely just as soon uh, as possible. Uh, it, it is important that we put uh, the health and safety of our neighbors and our families and of ourselves uh, first right now by staying home. Um, we can still find ways to worship and i will i will do that as well you can still have that big easter dinner at home um, but you can stay home and save lives and there's not anything more christ-like uh, than that so uh, in closing i know that a lot of people uh, are, are feeling some anxiety uh, like they're not in control of things right now um, one of the things that we like to do in louisiana uh, to come together and an experience we can share and actually relive again uh, will be the Saints uh, beating the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, that'll be on tonight. Uh, you, you'll recall this game. This was the first game back in the Superdome after Hurricane Katrina. It'll be on tonight on ESPN, uh, and so I encourage people uh, to watch that. 
uh, in conjunction with the event and if you are able and, and you see fit, I would encourage you to consider donating to the Gail Benson Community Assistance Fund uh, through the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Uh, and that fund is providing assistance to the New Orleans service industry uh, during this time, which is obviously uh, one of the areas of our economy, among many, uh, that are really suffering right now. So you can do this by visiting gnof.org slash Benson. So join me. I'll, I'll be home watching the game uh, tonight, uh, and I'd ask you all to join me. Now I'm going to ask the Attorney General to come up and share uh, some news uh, with you all, at the conclusion of which what I'd ask you to do, if you have questions about uh, the initiative that he's going to talk about, go ahead and address those to the Attorney General, um, and then and then following that, then I'll take your questions, and Alex is here to take your testing questions as well. Thank you, Governor. Glad to know my dad has something to do tonight. I know he'll be watching the Saints. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, I want to thank uh, the Governor for giving me an opportunity to come here and for working uh, with me on what we're about to announce. You know, the people of Louisiana should know that all of their elected officials are working on their behalf and all are working to keep themselves them safe. And, um, and in that, you know, I've been committed to fighting and winning this, ep uh, this epidemic. And I continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with the governor, the president, and all our health care officials as we work to help end the spread of COVID-19. I also want to thank, as the governor did earlier too, uh, our health care providers, our doctors, our nurses, and everyone who is supporting them as well. Because working together is the, is the best way to beat this. You know, in order to combat this invisible enemy that has taken the lives of some of our citizens, halted our economies, and turned our livelihoods upside down, we must be willing to use all available tool, tools at our disposal. To that end, a week ago, I had announced a donation of 400,000 hydroxychloroquine tablets given to the state of Louisiana by Amnio Pharmaceuticals. This medication is being used by doctors in Louisiana right now to try and help treat COVID-19 patients. I can report to you today that this medication, through the hard work of pharmaceutical distributor Morrison Dixon of Shreveport, has already delivered to nearly a hundred tier one locations around Louisiana. The donation was secured timely and it coincided with the approval of a clinical study by the LSU Medical School to determine whether or not hydroxychloroquine is an effective treatment against COVID-19. Their clinical actually includes two parts. Part one was the treatment of patients infected by the virus, and part two is to determine whether or not there existed a prophylactic treatment to inoculate our first-line medical uh, providers. I appreciate the, Louis, uh, the LSU Medical School Dean, Dr. Stephen Nelson's kind words uh, in thanking Amnio and ourselves for securing this donation. Today, the governor and I are actually making this announcement together because to treat patients infected with COVID-19 and utilizing hydroxychloroquine, the drug must be coupled with erythromycin, or more commonly known as Zithromax. As this medication continues to show some promising results around the world, the demand for the drug becomes great. As supplies diminish our ability for us here in Louisiana to benefit from any of the effects of its treatment could become jeopardized. I would like to note that these drugs are really not experimental drugs in and by themselves. Each of these drugs have been on the market for quite some time, of course used to treat other medical conditions and have been approved by the FDA and medical providers for those use. Last week, my Chief Deputy Bill Stiles and I contacted Teva Pharmaceuticals, a manufacturer of both hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax in its genetic form, to discuss the ability of the state to access these drugs for our infection, as our infection rate rose. Because Teva is a named plaintiff in our ongoing opioid litigation, I not only uh, sought out the consent and counsel of the governor, I asked for his further assistance in helping to secure what we're about to announce. So I want to thank him for his help.
Today, we are announcing that we have secured an additional, additional medication from Teva Pharmaceuticals, who has made available 8,000 Z-Packs and an additional 75,000 hydroxychloroquine tablets. I want to caution everyone that it is important to remember that these drugs don't represent a silver bullet or a magic wand. However, many medical doctors have chosen to prescribe these drugs to relieve symptoms of the virus in some patients. In some cases, allowing the recovery of these patients without the use of a ventilator or hospitalization. That is important. Why? Because any positive results in a patient by these drugs, whether incremental or significant, could potentially allow our ventilator needs to decrease or the capacity of ventilators that we have to be more readily available. Again, while these drugs are in an experimental phase, it is our hope that the access to these drugs now will allow both LSU's clinical study to continue and patients in Louisiana to have some hope of relief as their local doctors choose whether or not to utilize these prescriptions. Additionally, I'd like to make another announcement or note today. Some people uh, had contacted us to look at the Governor Andrew Cuomo's executive order where he granted immunity for doctors and healthcare workers dealing with COVID-19. For those in the healthcare field, I would like you to know quickly about our existing law. This is something the governor and I discussed this morning as well, and we both, as lawyers, not doctors, agree, agree with. Should a doctor prescribe hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax to a patient in Louisiana in connection with the current COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with FDA's clinical approval, that doctor's action would likely fall within the immunity statute that we currently already have in Louisiana. Of course, I would note that the facts and circumstances surrounding any incident will always determine whether an individual is entitled to immunity. But as a blanket order, the immunity statutes that we have here in Louisiana or go even further than Governor Cuomo's executive order. I will continue to do everything that we can to assist our state's effort to fight this pandemic in Louisiana. I again want to thank the governor uh, for helping us secure this medication and because it is going to be one more step in helping to protect us here in Louisiana. Thank you. If you got questions for that, go ahead and, and ask them now, the Attorney General, if you don't mind. Those are all of those tablets and antibodies have been secured and are being distributed now, General? So the, the, uh, the 400,000 tablets of hydroxychloroquine were received last Monday, and half of those have been distributed to hospitals uh, according to their need. The Zithromax and additional hydroxychloroquine, we got an email today that are being packaged and should be here by tomorrow, no later than Wednesday is what we've been told by Tiva. Thank you. And, and can you just walk through, um, you said some of this is involving research at the LSU uh, medical centers. Can you talk a little bit more about what kind of research they're doing? Yes, yeah, so, and, and, I, and I believe LSU put out a press release over the weekend on this. They uh, received approval for two clinical studies. In those studies, um, of course, one of them is to actually treat patients that are in university hospitals, right, in Shreveport, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. And so they will be using those drugs in a combination on patients as they come in and to determine what the effects of the drugs on the virus. Do you know, and maybe this might be better for Dr. B, uh, I, I've read a couple articles that because hydro, 
hydroxychloroquine has become so much in demand for COVID patients that lupus patients who deal with them are struggling to get the medication. What do you know about that situation? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't mind. That's actually why we're doing this today. One of the big reasons uh, or, or one of the, the great news surrounding the hydroxychloroquine that we got last Monday was actually to relieve that supply, right? So the more we get donated by pharmaceutical manufacturers, the more we get into the state, actually relieves the ability uh, of the supply of hydroxychloroquine so that those patients who have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis have access to that medicine. Um, I will tell you that, I, in fact, I reported that to the governor earlier today as well. I spoke to a number of, 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 of uh, large chains and also some distributors here in Louisiana, and I don't find, as far as right now, a, a huge shortage of hydroxychloroquine. So they should be able to receive their medication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Attorney General. Th this is really important. You, you will recall that a couple of weeks ago, the pharmacy board thought that they needed to do an emergency rule because the demand was outstripping the supply. And there was some concern about whether people with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis would be able to continue to get it and, and so forth. They ultimately rescinded that rule in favor of some guidance uh, because they believed that the supply would catch up. Uh, but with the work that he did last week um, and and this week, then it's gonna it's gonna be even better. And and we know that we had doctors across the state of Louisiana uh, who were prescribing um, Plaquenil, which is the name for hydroxychloroquine, uh, before uh, these announcements re really got came out of Washington. And so so this is a treatment that doctors were doing. Uh, and so it's, it's important that they have the ability uh, to, to find this drug. And so I think it's a great thing uh, that they're coming to Louisiana. Uh, and, and we are not doctors. We're not involved in the trial. We're not here to testify as to the efficacy of the, of the drug as it relates to COVID-19. But we know we have trials ongoing, and we know there are doctors who want to use it. And so making it available is exactly the right thing to do. And so I, want to, I thank you very much, Jeff. Yes, sir. Governor, I know you've seen the model of the University of Washington model that you've talked about before that drastically, this latest adjustment drastically reduces the number of projected deaths both in the U.S. and Louisiana. Is that something after consulting with Dr. B? What's your take on that? Yeah, well, first of all, it's, it's heartening to see models uh, that are gaining currency that show a lower death total. And we certainly hope and pray that that uh, is the direction that we're going to go. Uh, the the numbers um, in that uh, particular study, I'm sorry, in that particular model, don't match up so well with what we've already experienced. Uh, so we're trying to reconcile the assumptions that underlie that model with the assumptions that underlie ours. Uh, but but we do believe that regardless of what the Washington model showed, that that we are starting to see improvements in our in our numbers related principally to hospitalizations uh, and deaths. Uh, and and as, as we get more testing online, we're not such a big outlier anymore. Uh, now, we, we still have more than our fair share of deaths and it's because we're not as healthy as we should be. And hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease, obesity, all these things are feeding into that. But as we get more tests in and, and, and figure out where we really are, how much COVID is in Louisiana, our numbers are really starting to look much more like we would expect uh, them to look. Uh, and, and so, you know, we're encouraged by all of that. But we know that if we, if we have a positive trend developing, it is because of the mitigation measures that we've taken. And it is because of the work being done in our hospitals, all of which is buying time to allow us to continue to surge our medical capacity. So the message for today, and I don't want anyone to mistake this, is that even if we are starting to see improvements in the numbers and we're starting to develop a trend uh, that's very helpful, uh, we have to maintain what we're doing with respect to the mitigation, the stay-at-home order, uh, social distancing, all the hygiene practices that we've been talking about for literally weeks now. Yes, sir. 
Governor, the uh, your administration changed its policy surrounding what would, it would hand out uh, with regards to information on nursing homes. Uh, you previously identified the nursing homes. You're no longer doing that. Can you explain the policy rationale for doing that? And also, will you give that information out in response to a public records request? Will I give what information out? The names of the nursing homes that have coronavirus clusters uh, confirmed there. I don't know, but if you if you submit the request, you'll get an answer. It may not be what you're asking for because I'd have to sit down with my executive council and, and we'll decide what, what, what you would get. Um, and, I, and I know that Dr. Biu uh, has been studying the clusters and, 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 and was uh, involved in the change in our policy, so I'm going to ask you to come up. Yeah, so uh, as we talked about last week, we had a team from the CDC come down, actually uh, several of those individuals still in state. Uh, and part of what the CDC team was helping us do in general was look at um, our practices as our numbers continue to increase. What could we do to maintain uh, our ability to target those areas where contact tracing and um, uh, slowing the spread um, uh, through direct contact are still very important and also manage areas like the Greater New Orleans area where we have just widespread community spread of COVID. Uh, and then tailored into that was also our relationship with um, uh, our clusters uh, with nursing homes and making sure that most importantly, we're getting accurate information uh, that helps us intervene. Um, and what they shared with us as a best practice is essentially moving to, to the position we currently have where we're sharing the number of uh, nursing homes that report uh, one or more cases. We're sharing the numbers of cases associated with uh, nursing homes uh, across the state and then deaths associated with uh, nursing homes across the state. So it gives you a sense of these very uh, special populations that we have uh, a lot of concern about um, without potentially jeopardizing their willingness to share openly. Uh, increasingly, as the epidemic goes on, we are more and more reliant on our nursing homes giving us transparent information, uh, and we need them to, to uh, continue to do that uh, in order for us to give you accurate information. So that's the, the position that we took, uh, again, under uh, uh, guidance and, and with advice from the S uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But on that subject, were the nursing homes um, saying they would not provide that information if you kept releasing their names publicly? So the nursing homes never said anything like that, to, to me at least. So then why was there an assumption that in order to continue to get them to provide the information, you have to be willing to not provide their names? So again, we moved from a position where we were uh, able to do almost all of the direct outreach um, in a very timely fashion to now where numbers are coming in. And frankly, to be timely in addressing clusters, we really needed to continue to encourage that uh, nursing homes, which are obligated under our emergency rule, to report, do that in a timely fashion. Uh, and in, in consultation with the CDC, they felt that um, while uh, it was laudable that we were sharing a lot of information, uh, they were concerned about what that would pretend, what would that would mean for the nursing homes sharing uh, as this continues. Yes, sir. In some states, there are reports of racial and income disparities when it comes to deaths related to this virus. Are we seeing any trends here in Louisiana? If so, would that information be made public and where can we find it? Yes, yeah, so we're going to have a public uh, facing portion of our dashboard that's going to talk about uh, as it relates to deaths. Um, I don't know about the socioeconomic status of, of the victims, but certainly by race. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a disparity because right now, slightly more than 70% of all of our deaths are among African Americans, uh, who make up about 32% or so of the overall population of our state. So obviously this is a big disparity and we're gonna try to figure out uh, what that is attributable to and what, what we can uh, do about that as, as quickly as possible. So yes, you're, you're going to see that it, that will be updated once a week on on the dashboard. If you go to, um, I don't, I don't I'll, I'll find the uh, LDH. Uh, yeah, yeah, LDH. LDH. You, you can you can you can find it there. Yes, sir. Governor, do you have you sounded an optimistic tone, sort of on uh, obviously hospitalizations and vents are both pretty flat over the last couple of days. Um, what does this mean for the projections you've been giving out for when New Orleans would run out of uh, ventilators and hospital beds? Well, well, obviously, what it means is that date is pushed out in time. Uh, and we're not as close to, to those dates as, as we were Do you have specific as we thought. To share? I, I don't have one to share with you uh, right now. Um, again, we are, we're, we're modifying uh, the, the modeling based on, on the rate of transmission, the, the, the growth in cases 
and and it gets it gets complex and I wasn't a mathematician but I know it's it's we're trying to figure out what, what our R not is what what is that rate of spread um, and it and it appears we're trending in a positive direction because of the mitigation measures that, that we that we've undertaken uh, and and so for those reasons uh, along with the fact that, as I mentioned before our hospitals are doing a really good job uh, in keeping some people off the ventilator altogether who previously would have been put on the ventilator uh, and limiting the number of days on a ventilator uh, for those patients who actually have to have one and also appear to be uh, uh, reducing the number of days of the average hospital stay all of which ties into the modeling to figure out when we're going to exceed our our capacity and so so these things are changing but they're changing in a in a positive way right now uh, and and that's that's the news that we have for you today. I don't have an exact date for you. Do models anymore. still show it this week? Because I know this was the week we were no. going to run out, right? Dude? Is that still the case? No, uh, that that is that is no longer the case. Yes, sir. Governor, last week you were assured that there would not be DPS checkpoints along the Texas and Louisiana state line. Obviously, that changed yesterday. How has that policy change been explained to you? And do you feel like Texas officials misled you? No, I, I don't feel like the Texas officials misled me. I had a, a phone conversation last week with Governor Abbott. Um, we talked about this briefly, and I think just about every single day, um, the head of, of, uh, of uh, public safety in Texas is talking to Colonel Reeves, who is the superintendent of state police here, uh, and sharing the information with what they're doing. First of all, commercial traffic is not being hindered at all. Uh, it's my understanding that they're pulling over every fifth vehicle from out of state going into Texas, and it has nothing to do with whether that, that vehicle is from Louisiana or not. Uh, so they're not treating Louisiana residents any differently, and they're not telling people that you can't come to Texas. What they're saying is if you're going to be here for less than 14 days, uh, we, we're asking you to quarantine for that 14-day period. If you're going to be here for more than 14 days, quarantine for the first 14 days of your stay here. And as I mentioned before, I'm asking people to stay home anyway. I'm asking people to stay home and not engage in unessential travel. That is what the Texas governor is asking. So I'm not going to come up here and, and, and pretend to be upset with the Texas governor. I'm just not. Uh, but we are communicating, uh, and I have not been deceived at all. Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about some positive trends in some of the numbers. I know modeling showed late last week um, for every one positive COVID patient, they were infecting a little over two. And this might be a question mm -hmm. for Dr. B. Has, I know we've seen that number drop a few times during this outbreak. Has Is that still kind of where we stay in the one uh, for two? Okay. So <clears throat> I probably should let Alex do this uh, at the first instance. But I'm, I'm going to give it a shot, and I want you to come up and, and correct if I'm wrong. We now believe that several weeks ago, before we were really paying attention, when the virus really got seeded into Louisiana, and particularly around the New Orleans area, that the initial transmission rates could have been up as high as three. Uh, and this is before anybody was paying attention, knew that the virus was here, um, and so forth. We then know, uh, believe that, that the average is 2.4 if you don't have any mitigation measures into place. And so we think it, it naturally on its own came down to a 2.4. We started modeling at a 2.0 once we started putting restrictive measures into place. And the more restrictive they are, the lower that R not should be, depending upon the degree to which you're getting compliance. Uh, and, and so we started modeling at 2.0 hoping we were going to get to a 1.7, which is, which is the next line that, that, that we would build into our modeling. Um, and if we have really, really good compliance, and I guess universal compliance with our existing stay-at-home order, uh, meaning only uh, essential workers were out traveling about and, and people were only leaving home to do the things that were essential and otherwise they were staying at home and all that sort of stuff, you could potentially get to a 1.3. So what is, what is safe to say is we thought we were to 2.0 last week. Uh, the trends that we're seeing suggest that we're lower than a 2.0, but exactly where we don't know. And the reason is because the lowest data we have uh, in terms of test results and so forth came in yesterday, but it was a Sunday. And so those, those if you go back all four weeks that we've been doing this, it's the Sundays where you typically get the fewest reports. And I think that's a function of 
the commercial labs because over over 90 percent of our test results now are coming in from commercial labs and they just have this battle rhythm to what they're doing and for whatever reason on sundays those reports are, are lower than they are every other day of the week but if this data is confirmed over the next several days uh, that, that we will know uh, and i hope that i can come out tomorrow and the next day and say hey we, we continue to be on that uh, uh, line that we want to be where we're flattening the curve and, and ultimately you, you want to see it to, to start going down too and again it's not just your tests it's it's the hospital admissions and it's your deaths uh, and that's that's what I'm, I'm particularly uh, paying attention to uh, as are the folks who are modeling this who, who are doing uh, a really great job look this is this is a novel coronavirus this is new and every day the scientists, the doctors, the mathematicians, they're learning because they're not just studying here. Uh, we're studying what's happening in Italy, uh, in South Korea, and in Spain. And all of that influences what, what they're, uh, uh, the way that we're modeling here and around the country. Uh, and so I, I do want people to be patient with us because things change. Things change. And, and they're changing in part and we should all be thankful to this because our doctors and our hospitals and our nurses are doing a much, much better job. They are learning, developing best, best practices and then sharing those with other hospitals and other providers across the state and across the country, really. Uh, and that is, that is helping uh, too. Uh, so I would just ask everybody to continue to be thankful for all the uh, doctors and nurses and, and therapists and all the other providers. And then in this Holy Week, let's lift one another up in prayer. Let's be patient. Uh, let's make sure that we're doing what's, what's required of us now uh, uh, over the next several weeks so that we can get back to that point sooner rather than later when we can uh, be together uh, and, and so forth. So, Attorney General, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for being here today. Alex, thank you very much. And thank you all. We'll, we'll do this tomorrow about the same time. And for the past 47 minutes, you have been watching Governor John Bell Edwards update the state's uh, citizens on efforts to fight COVID-19 here. Let us start by taking a look at the numbers again. 14,867 cases have been confirmed in Louisiana. That includes uh, 512 deaths, 35 more since yesterday were reported. 1,809 people are currently in the hospital. 563 on ventilators. For perspective, though, the governor said that new hospital admissions are trending down, and that led the governor to say, quote, we are starting to see real signs that the mitigation efforts are showing real results. So we may be seeing the beginning of the flattening of the curve. That would be great news, but he was very quick to admonish everyone to still follow the stay at home order to keep us on that trend. A disturbing trend of note that he did pass along 70% make that more than 70% of all of the deaths in Louisiana involve African Americans. He said it is worthy of investigating at this point. The only thing they do know is that uh, high blood pressure is the leading underlying condition for people across the board who have died here. You also heard from Attorney General Jeff Landry, who said that the state has received a donation of 400,000 hydroxychloroquine tablets. Uh, you've heard the president talk about this um, and tout its efficacy. It is not proven, but the studies at this point, um, according to Attorney General Jeff Landry, look very promising, especially when coupled with um, the z -packs. So we have received as a state 400,000 tablets, half of which have already been distributed. So um, some good news in the in the in terms of the fact that the governor thinks we may be starting to see a flattening of the curve, but how important it is that we all continue to wash our hands, social distance and stay at home unless there is something essential we need to leave the house for. Uh, we do expect President Trump to uh, give his daily 